From The Independent, a UK military chief warns global tensions like those seen before the First World War. Now, I'm pretty sure this guy wasn't alive before the First World War, so we'll take it with a grain of salt. But I, before I read into this, I want to make a point about uh, a video I watched the other day from Razor Fist. I don't know if you guys know who Razor Fist is, but he makes some really great rant videos. And he made an actual, uh, a, a video that was much calmer. It has nothing to do with World War or anything like that. But he said something that was actually kind of chilling. He talked about how he wanted to make a video about Patreon and Sargon of Akkad. And that every time he did, he felt some kind of dread. And he, he said, we know, history has shown us, when the discussion stops, fists start flying. And with Google and Patreon and Twitter and all these companies taking down creators, taking down people who are talking about ideas, they are telling us the discussion is over. And that leads us, that leads us to one place, a, 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 a very scary place. I saw this article, and while I would say take it with a grain of salt, you know, this person obviously wasn't alive during World War, World War I, before World War I, I think it's important to realize our world rests upon a precarious system. It's extremely easy to disrupt. One, one supply, one item at the core of our supply chain can disrupt global economies. Fuel, for instance, is probably the leading driver of conflict in the 20th century. Fuel and energy. I mean, there's political reasons, there's ideological reasons for sure. But what happens when a nation, when a large group of people is cut off from a resource? If they have no choice, they will fight. And honestly, can you blame them? When someone starves and they're going to die and they go and rob a store for food, can you really blame them? And there, there, there's, there's a certain point you recognize that some things are just wrong, but you also have to realize that whatever the circumstances are for the starvation, for the desperation, people will do whatever it takes to survive. And you'll have to resist that if you want to survive. The real world outside of the glorious wonder bubble that is our safe haven, it's really terrifying. And I've been there and I've been to these places and I've seen people kill each other. A lot of people in America don't seem to understand just how truly terrifying the world can be. But I like to tell people to imagine this scenario. You're standing in the middle of the woods. You're, you're no city, no town for miles. You're, you have a rifle and you have a little, uh, can, a little canteen with some water in it. You have very little food. You don't know where your food is going to come from. You're desperate. As you're walking through the forest, you see a man in the distance who looks exactly like you. Same canteen, little pouch, what looks like is food, and a rifle. What do you do? And this is the scenario that countries are faced with. Now, eventually you scale that up and you have nations. Nations are much harder to move. But eventually, the, the point of the scenario is, the, the, there's multiple outcomes. Do you take the food and resources from this other person? Do you agree to work together? What if they don't speak your language? What if they try to kill you first to take your stuff? What do you do when you're confronted with this person standing in front of you, holding a weapon, and you don't know what they'll do. And this is how war begins. Because for many people, the easiest thing to do is try and take that person out before they take you out. You can't risk the conversation. Who knows what they'll do? It's tough. Let's read the story. The international security landscape is the most uncertain politically and strategically in living memory. With instability, the defining condition, and where threats to our nation are diversifying, proliferating and intensifying very rapidly, the head of Britain's military has warned. The constant confrontation across the world is reminiscent of the first decade of the 20th century of the great power, of the great power competition that ended with the conflagration of the First World War, General Sir Nick Carter said in his annual lecture. He claimed, he claimed that hostile states such as, such as Russia and China and Iran's flexing of muscle, challenging our security and stability and prosperity, but there were also the added dangers of the terrorist groups such as ISIS and the bellicose nature of populism and nationalism that seek to exploit mass migration, which many see as an existential threat to Europe. The chief of the defense staff, CDS, address came in a week of extraordinary political tumult with the survival of Theresa May's government in question and the Brexit process in disarray. He began his speech at the Royal United, United Services Institute in London, saying, without getting overly excited, I guess there's never been a better week for a CDS to be controversial. Carter continued, We live in a multipolar world of competing powers, with diverging views on how the world should work, different values, a sense of historic entitlement, and even some scores to settle. Meanwhile, the character of politics and warfare is evolving rapidly. 
driven by the pervasiveness of information and the rate of technological change. Our competitors have become masters at exploiting the seams between peace and war. What constitutes a weapon in this gray zone below the threshold of conventional war no longer has to go bang. He pointed to a worrying lack of knowledge or interest among the public about how current geopolitical issues have evolved. I was at the airport in Omaha not that long ago, and there was an older gentleman who looked like he had to be in his late 70s. And we were waiting in line, and he looked at me, and I, you know, I had my backpack, and I had a camera and everything, and he said, do a lot of traveling? You, you here for, you know, where are you going? You going back to uh, the East Coast for family? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm going home. You know, I was just here to try and get away from everything. Uh, I went to Omaha just to kind of go somewhere different that wasn't on the coasts. And he just said, I've never seen it this bad. I asked him what he meant, and he said that he lived through the civil rights era, and that even when it felt like, you know, historically, the U.S. was at its worst, for this generation, I should say, obviously it's been worse, but he said the political turmoil that he's experienced in his life, that even back then, he's never seen it this bad. And I asked him specifically, are you talking about, you know, are you talking about the, the street battles, the, 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 the political division, the div division in our country, the conflicts overseas? And he said it was basically all of it. It's basically all of it. In the United States, the tensions are higher than he had ever seen. And that kind of freaked me out. It, and, and I see a story like this, and we see the, the video from Razor Fist, and I feel like if, you know, we don't want to be paranoid. We don't want to be conspiracy theorists. We don't want to be fringe preppers who build underground bunkers and, and dump all of our resources into an emergency evacuation fallout center, shelter or anything like that. But I also want to point out that sometimes the stories actually are crazy. And sometimes people believe that it's impossible, that none of this could happen, that things are perfect and will never change. I read a story in the news once about a bank robbery. Security guard watched three men come in with masks on and guns, and he did nothing. And then eventually they ran up on him and took his gun from him. And people asked him later, why didn't you do anything? And his response was something like, I couldn't believe it was actually happening. Denial. Some things are just so shocking that people don't want to believe it could really happen in front of them, so the security guard did nothing as these men came in to rob the bank. The reason I'm bringing that up is that we have the statement now from a high-ranking official within the UK government. We have what's seemingly in front of our eyes, the escalation of political tensions, the culture war itself. While many people might want to downplay what the culture war, the culture civil war really is, when you see what Patreon does, when you see what these platforms do, they are removing people from the economy. As he expressed, what is a weapon in this gray zone below the threshold of conventional war no longer has to go bang. And what that means is I do believe there is a threat. Cyber war happens all the time. And we can't see it. There are real threats. There's real conflict. People don't seem to realize that the cold struggle between nations probably always exists and is always bad, even among allies to a certain extent. Well, let's read on. Let's read on. He said... Of course, people don't really study history any longer. He pointed to a, a recent survey of 2,000 people about the First World War. 50% thought Winston Churchill was the prime minister at the time, and 10% thought it was Margaret Thatcher. 20% thought we were fighting the French. 6% thought it was President Kennedy's assassination that triggered the war. And when asked about the bloodiest battle of the war, was 16, uh, when asked what the bloodiest battle of the war was, 16% voted for Pearl Harbor, 8% for Independence Day. 7% for Hastings, and 5% for Helm's Deep. <laughs> yes, that's 100 of the 2,000 who were asked who thought it was a battle from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Stressing the need to raise public perception of the threats face now, Carter said, because it is new and exploits new technologies, this kind of warfare is unregulated. We no longer have the same depth of mutual understanding, and the tried and tested diplomatic instruments and conventions that used to be a feature of international relations, such as confidence-building measures, arms reduction negotiations, public monitoring, and inspection of each other's military activity, are not what they once were. In purely military terms, he stated, countries like Russia and China have studied our strength and invested carefully in new methods and capabilities that are designed to exploit weaknesses, cyber, ballistic, and cruise missiles, low-yield nuclear weapons, space and counter-space weapons, electronic warfare, integrated air and missile defense systems, multi-barreled thermobaric rocket launchers, linked digitally to drone targeting systems, new conventional capability, 
such as low-signature submarines, modern aircraft, and armored vehicles. When it came to sophisticated weapons, worryingly, many of these systems are now in the hands of proxy states. No longer can we guarantee our freedom of action from air or sea and on land, he said. Looking to the future, Carter said, we will need to be clear in a post-Brexit world what role we play in the world. For example, is our ambition to be globally deployable or global? And what level of activity should we plan for? We have to find the right balance between fight, to fight tonight and fight tomorrow, as this is essential for the long-term sustainability of our armed forces. The, government, the government's modernizing defense program due to be made public soon, said Senator Carter, has sought to address the challenges. We need to mobilize to meet today's threats. We must modernize to meet the future threats. And we must transform ourselves to become the agile and adaptive organization that the future demands, he said. And while it may be that he's just trying to rile up the UK to support defense measures, I also think it's fair to say that we shouldn't take his experience for granted. Now, he, again, wasn't alive before the First World War, but we shouldn't presume these things can never happen. We shouldn't be panic-stricken. We shouldn't be building nuclear bunkers, as I explained. But I also think we should be vigilant and make sure that as tensions escalate internally and externally, we're prepared for any potential threat or danger that comes our way lest we find ourselves vulnerable, and lest we find our friends and families vulnerable as well, or just in serious mortal danger. It's been a long time since the world was actually facing complete annihilation, or it could be that we've always been facing complete annihilation, we just like to pretend that today is safer and better than it was in the past. Now, we aren't in a world war like we were in World War I and II, but it's fair to say that since the Cold War, there's still been tensions between nations. And I would say with the conflict in the South China Sea, the cyber threats that we face from Russia, China, and other, other countries, it may actually come to a point where things get really, really bad. And on an international scale, the discussion ends and fists start flying. That being said, I'd, I'd like to encourage people to not panic and think of things as so dire but the story absolutely caught my eye, both because of the problems we've seen, as I mentioned, internally and externally. So there it is. Stick around. More videos to come. And I will see you in a few minutes.